Welcome everyone to the Flute Center of New York. I'm so glad you could come. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce my old friend, Mark Sparks, who's going to perform with us tonight. Um, I've known Mark since we were cowboys in Texas together. <laughs> but he hung up his boots a cowboy, yeah. and uh, recently retired from the St. Louis uh, Orchestra. And uh, we're really happy to have him here. Um, he's also written a number of, I think, what, about five books on uh, orchestral excerpts for all you flutists out there, um, and uh, some other books uh, on various various stuff. Yeah. So, but uh, I think it's a must-have study if you're if you're a flutist. Anyway, um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Linda Mark, who's a wonderful accompanist and pianist here in New York, and my friend Mark. Take it away. <laughs>
So uh, tonight we're doing some arrangements that I made, and uh, that was uh, Frank Andantino Quietoso. And uh, it's an early piece for Frank. Um, a lot of Frank's chamber music actually is not that well known uh, anymore. Uh, but uh, he composed that for his brother so they could play it together when they were trying to get uh, known in Paris. Uh, and uh, I think it goes pretty well on flute. Anyway, uh, next is uh, the three fantasy pieces by Reinecke. For the sake of uh, time, we're doing the second movement. Uh, and Reinecke actually has quite a few pieces that uh, are, are adaptable uh, for flute uh, quite well, I think. This is originally a viola and piano piece well known to violists.
finally, <clears throat> let's see, we're doing the third movement of Amanda Myers' uh, sonata. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with who she was, uh, she was uh, one of the foremost violinists of her time. She was a Swedish violinist uh, and very famous uh, in Sweden. She was the first graduate of the Helsinki Conservatory with a music directorship uh, degree. Uh, and she composed a fair amount, not nearly enough. Um, she was very much admired by Brahms and Joachim, the Schumanns. She was sort of in that whole uh, circle, and she toured widely. Uh, unfortunately, she died of tuberculosis at 41, so that's a, a real loss, uh, as you will hear.
everyone, let's welcome Blue Shelton, everyone. Hi, Blue. Welcome. Okay, good. So you're going to play Daphnis. Yes. Okay, go for it. That's pretty solid. Uh, and, you know, I think that there are some fine points that you could work on. But basically, that's very good for auditions. So, uh, you know, everyone, the trick with, uh, with auditions, which he's uh, which doing very well with, is to get your expression into the rhythm. So when you're doing an audition, uh, they're going to question first whether you have just you, regardless of the orchestra, whether you have good rhythm. Um, and you may think, maybe that's not so important, but actually it's really important because a lot of times the conductors you know, a lot of them, they don't really want to micromanage the rhythm in the orchestra. They want to work with the orchestra on their interpretation. So sometimes they will just rely on the orchestra to basically play together, which means that everybody has to have a fairly similar idea of where the beat is. And that's the reason why. You can think of it like, you know, chamber music on a large scale. Uh, and sometimes a great deal of rhythmic sensitivity is required because we have to adjust what we do all the time in order to play, for example, with someone across the stage. And it takes a, a high degree of sensitivity to recognize you know, to negotiate with the conductor and then what you're hearing from the other player. So, so that's why there's the emphasis on the rhythm. Okay, it's not just to be difficult, all right? Uh, and the hard thing to do, um, which, you know, this is, this is very, very good. I mean, it takes a lot of work to play uh, Daphnis this way, uh, is that you have to get all of the expression, you know, the, all the things you're doing for the expression with the tone and all this, and with the very steady rhythm at the same time. And that's, that can be hard because, especially with longer notes, can't it? Like a lot of times when we have long notes, we kind of slow the rhythm down a little bit or we get distracted by making the tone on the long notes, right? So. Uh, you know, the only way to do that is to really practice it quite carefully with a metronome and 
then really get the expression into it. Is this the kind of thing that you're thinking about? Because I have like some, I played it for some other people and they were like telling me like I was taking like too much time in certain places. Yeah. And you know, this can be, uh, you know, for a young player, this can be a little bit uh, confusing because when we think of playing expressively, the first thing that we think about is manipulating the rhythm, right? We, we like to do rubato, don't we? And it's kind of a natural thing that we, and it, as an advanced player, you, maybe you, you, for the sake of expression, you know, it would be at the expense of, of the rhythm. But it's actually not true. It doesn't carry through. Wynton Marsalis, for example, has the best rhythm of any human being on the planet. And can you tell me he doesn't play freely? He plays very freely. But you know, he always knows exactly where the beat is. And that, that's what uh, those advanced players are doing. So they haven't forgotten about the beat. They know the beat actually better than everybody else. They just keep it to themselves. Okay. Uh, so uh, you know you're not out, you're not out of line in thinking this way. You're really uh, if you want to win orchestra auditions, you must take care of the rhythm in every example first. Okay. It's just just have to face facts that that is true. Okay. Good. Now, as to a few of the other things, um, you know, I was a little bit surprised by something that happened, which is that when you went to the forte here, that's the loudest part of the melody, you cracked the note. Does that happen a lot? I mean, is, or was that just a, out of nowhere? Like, sometimes I crack a note and I'm like, what the heck? I, I never cracked that note before, you know? Yeah, I do like crack sometimes. Yeah. I'll bet you do. I'll bet you do. So um, when you crack a note, um, just generally, why does that happen? I think because I'm like overblowing. Uh huh. So when you're over, he says overblowing, the, the air's going a little bit too high across the instrument. Okay. So if you have a problem with cracking notes, then try to just keep the air down. Don't let it go up. Now that may be a question of your position in general and there's some there's some variables there aren't there to to deal with, right? Uh, but I think that uh, your in terms of the way you're set up, your lower lip is very prominent in your embouchure. That's going to raise the air column. It gives a certain quality which is very there's a lot of pleasant things about it but you may have a tendency to raise the air column when you don't want to in a situation like that, okay? So uh, at that point, make sure that your jaw is relaxed and that your upper lip is sort of, uh, you know, sort of being a good guardian of the air column, not letting it rise up. Play, play me that scale and let's sustain the B and you think about this position that I'm talking about. Okay, just play the scale. Exactly, so your upper lip has to be involved. Let's, let's have a nice strong beat, shall we? Brilliant and strong and vibrant. Your vibrato is a little, you know, it's a little bit sleepy, isn't it, for that moment? I mean, don't we want, oh, you know, if, if you know the harmony there, the harmony is, it's a little bit of a shock, you know, it's a little bit dissonant uh, right there. And uh, so let's have the passion and excitement uh, coming out nicely there, okay? Let's hear that. Can you make the vibrato more passionate? Come on, more from the heart. <laughs> well, don't crack the note. Keep the ear. Yeah, see, this is the complication. That's all right. That's why we're here. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, 
Good. Now, in general, so that, you know, in terms of what you're, the way you're set up, like the way that you're uh, blowing on the instrument and everything, I think that you're in extremely good shape. I mean, obviously, you are a very, very talented flutist. Um, and, but I do think you may need to, you know, just kind of get in the mirror and take a look. Where do you, where do you think the air is going, actually? You know, this is always a really good question to ask as a flutist, isn't it? Where is the air, right? Blow straight, okay? It's just good tone. You can say it in two words, blow straight, okay? If you think that air is going off into the weeds over there, well, make some adjustments. Get in the mirror, blow over there, over there. You can change anything you want. None of this is set in stone, okay? Uh, we can change how we play, okay? You can, you can transform the musician that you are, okay? Everything is negotiable, okay? Sometimes we think that we are set on a certain path that, that somehow we can't escape it. You know, we are the way we are, and so on. And it's, there are, you, we do have physical, physical characteristics and limitations that are individual to all of us, but those things can usually be overcome. Anything can be overcome, okay? So uh, be, be open-minded about, about your possibilities of how great you can be, okay? And you can, given the right circumstances, you can. And uh, so I would just say to you, uh, experiment a little bit with what I'm talking about, of getting the air a little bit further down. Your tone, when you get louder, your tone gets thinner. And that means that the air is like getting squeezed up and too, much, too far across the instrument. Maybe sometimes you go a little sharp, mm -hmm. I would think, when you're playing loud, maybe. Well, like, I, I don't know, but. Well, like, also, I like kind of like. You're pulling? Uh, well, I like oh. was playing like really like turned in. Ah. So like two days ago, I switched to. Uh huh. So. Well, let's see where you are now. Can I see your flute? Do you mind? Yeah. If I, if I just take a look. It's still kind of, it's like a little kingdom, but like it's turned. Oh, this is around. beautiful. This is the way he has this set up. I like. Same. Good. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Uh, keep on, on that path. So, yeah, you're, so you're in that, that period of, of instability and adjustment. You're still trying to find the compass. And, but you, you will. You're going to get, it's going to be fabulous. Absolutely. Uh, just need to stick with it. Don't get discouraged. Some days it seems like, oh, this, I'll, ne I'll never do it, you know. But don't believe it. It's not true. You, you will. Uh, just have to hang in there. Good. So, you know, I mean, we can just talk about a few of these other things. Now, you're doing so well with, uh, with the rhythm that... Uh, maybe I can just offer you a few pointers on the musicianship. Now, I think there's a good, uh, a good lesson here, uh, which is that what you want to do with a melody, okay, yes, you have to learn it, le learn the notes, okay, and work on your tone and everything. All that's important. But the most important thing about the melody is the harmony. And if you, any melody, if you take a close look at the harmony, uh, a good composer will have buried a whole bunch of secrets in their implications in the harmony about maybe what you are supposed to do when you play it. And this can direct you to all sorts of cool places with changing your tone, shaping the melody in this sort of thing, okay? So I want you to, to go to the next level by just sit down at the piano or get a score, okay? And see if you can just hear or listen to the piece a lot. You know, there's a lot of recordings. And try to get a feel for the harmony. The question is, when the chord changes, what do you think happens to the melody as a result 
of that. Okay, and this is the this is the key to unlock the door for your musicianship. Get out of flute land and get into music. Okay, okay. Uh, don't be an instrumentalist. Be a musician. Okay, transcend instrumentalism. Now, just for example, uh, you know, just here at the at the beginning, you could change the vibrato and the color of the sound, the timbre of the sound, or whatever, the dynamic, a little bit more here, maybe more gentle. So you come up here, now maybe here a little bit more dolce, a little more gentle, a little softer, just show me that, and then I'm afraid we have to, we have to move on, just starting right there if you would please. of the harmony. When you play this, I need your impression of the harmony. Okay, so that's the next level. You're ready. Okay? Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs>
Um, but when you play the Hindemith, you sound like you are accompanying something else. You play, it sounds like you're playing along with something of a different character than that. Maybe that's the way you sound. So I think that in terms of your playing, you, you really have pretty much got it. But I think in terms of your musicianship, that I would want to see you change your, your view. So when we play, uh, you know, so some of our best solos are in the form of an obligato, like this. So there's a melody going on, and then this is the ornamentation version. Uh, usually, in most cases, the melody has already been heard. So the audience already heard the melody without the ornamentation. And then when the melody repeats later in the piece, right, then the ornamentation goes along with it. And much like William Tell, for example, is quite a bit the same. Uh, the ornamentation is the point. Uh, so that's what we really want to hear. So make sure you don't misunderstand your role in those, in those things. Um, it is chamber music, so, but I don't think we can say we, you are accompanying the melody. It's a little bit more like the melody is accompanying you, but the melody actually has to be steady, doesn't it? So you have to be steady, right? So that's how it's going to fit together. Um, and as we'll see, uh, it's a task to fit this together with the melody. It's one thing to play it in your practice room or in the audition. It's another thing to fit it with the melody. And uh, we, can, we can practice that a little bit. But generally, what I would like you to do first, just as a little exercise, is to play this legato and quite a bit slower. Okay. Go for it. Dolce espressivo. Play it as if it were written as the melody itself. Okay, and quite lyrically. Okay, yeah. Just from there. Just from uh, right here. And very espressivo, if you would please. turn off the soul button when you when you start to go faster. Okay. Okay. Very espressivo if you would please. Okay. Change her mind as she is playing. So 
I have, I, I just changed her entire orientation towards the piece over here, and now she can't play it, okay? But that's a good sign that she can't play it because uh, your approach, that means you truly have changed your view, okay? And now you have to learn to play it in a different way, feeling mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. But this is the way that it should, should be played. It should not sound too, uh, you know, dry, technical, or mechanical, too, uh, you know, inexpressive in a way. I, I hate to say that, but, you know, you weren't inexpressive. But I thought it was too bus business-like. And now I want to talk about the fawn as well, because I thought the fawn was, uh, your tone is gorgeous. You got developed a beautiful sound. But it's business-like, so like business, you know. We're doing the excerpts for auditions. Let's have the fawn. No, this is not it. You don't want to have that in your mind, okay? Uh, when you play the fawn, you have to sort of conjure a whole thing, a whole world that's very gentle and very beautiful, and you have to create that yourself, okay? And forget about auditioning. That's just not the point, you know? And actually, isn't that where you're trying to get with your, with your excerpts anyway? Uh, to, to that point where it, it really doesn't matter whether the committee is there or not. You, you could care less. Uh, or whether there's a screen, does that matter? When you're talking about playing Debussy, why does the screen matter? Like, Debussy is the greatest thing on earth. Uh, so discipline yourself to, to forget about this. Transport yourself artistically. Use your imagination, okay? And that is, ac yeah, you gotta play accurately. It's an audition, okay? Don't mess up and don't play out of tune and, and stuff like that. It has to be right. But that's actually not what they want either. They want the whole package. They want it to be right, and they want it to be super artistic, right? Okay, I'm gonna put those two things together. In order to do that, uh, you gotta get out of this reality of what you're doing, is auditioning for a job. No, <clears throat> go there as an artist and say, this is what I have to present, and actually it's really great, so you should listen, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's the attitude. It's not arrogant. It's confident. Okay. Yeah. Don't be arrogant, but be confident. It's this is an important difference there. Um, all right. And another thing, I'll give you a little tip. Uh, good. I think pursue this way with the Hindemith, and then do what we said with the with the Daphnis. Get all that expression, phrasing of the Hindemith. Get it fit into that, okay? Yeah, it's it's a tough ask, okay? <laughs> That's a hard one. It's really hard. And um, if we have time, I would love to. I can play the melody with you, but I don't know if we have time because now on the the fawn, I want you to first of all. I want, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine something d very uh, distant and mysterious, okay? Maybe fog, I don't know, whatever works for you. Okay. You, know, you can think of anything you want. You can think of your cat, if you want, <laughs> I don't care. But I think that you have to get your head space bigger and out, out of this business, you know? So I want you to do that by closing your eyes so you, you block out this. Uh, and, you know, really use your imagination when you play it. And I need it to be more expressive, okay? Don't change the rhythm, your rhythm's great, but more expressive. Let's have it. Come on, can you do it? The big challenge. Sure, yeah. Okay, and clo <laughs> close your eyes, just close your eyes, okay? Try it. Why, why 
why do, why do we start so businesslike on, on this note? Can it be like with mystery? And then what about the vibrato? Can it, can it, can it be shim, shimmering a little bit? Mm -hmm. You know, like the water when you see the, the sun on the water or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, let's have, try, try to start the note without tonguing it. I, I say poof. Still jumps out. A little more gradual, you've almost got it. Eyes closed, please. Better. More shimmery. Shimmery. Okay, yeah, you're just playing louder. I want you to. Can you copy that? I'm almost still a little faster than you. Ooh, well now that sounded quite nice. So she has this very round, beautiful quality and inside of it, there's something uh, shimmering, which is so, that's so magical, I think, you know, as a, you know, as a starting point, okay? Of course, you're gonna develop your own, I can only give you my, my interpretation and my wishes, which you're doing well with. Uh, and you will come to it yourself. Uh, okay, and so I think that the, try it again, and let's, you're really getting it, and one more time, very calm if you can at the beginning. It's getting better. It's getting better. Uh, but I think your vibrato is still going. Yeah. I don't think it's very attractive. Yeah. Yeah. shimmery in there. It has to have a little energy. Faster. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. So um, maybe try to move your vibrato off of this spot mm. and experiment. Use your recorder. Yeah. And just try to find where the truth is for you in there. But I say definitely play the fawn with your eyes closed. Okay. Yeah, it's the best way. Okay. Okay. Bravo. Thank and you.
Yeah, definitely fantastic in a lot of ways. Very good, very good. Um, I, I think you can definitely play uh, the Mendelssohn, and that is not, obviously not a problem for you, and uh, that will benefit you in your career. So whatever you've done to get it to that level, keep doing it. Uh, it, because it's it's really quite good. It may just only one comment. Mm -hmm. It may be a little too aggressively staccato and go a little bit more for I don't know. I guess something maybe a little more gentle with the articulation. It just sounds a little bit aggressive mm -hmm. with that. Um, but that's that's the only thing. Other than that, it's very good. I think Thank fantastic. And you know the daftness is good too. Um, I wanted to speak with you a little bit about tone color. Uh, your basic tone that you're kind of you know going to it has a lot of really good things about it, especially the way that you start. I think is beautiful. I think the the high G sharp is just absolutely lovely. Uh, I think as you descend on the instrument, you're not lowering the air column enough into the instrument to get, uh, you're, you're basically losing core, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, I think a little too often, um, he, it could get a little bit stronger core in the sound. So for example, you know, D-sharp is always a troublesome note, right? It's kind of different on every flute, and then you have to do this and that and the other to get it. Um, but for your D-sharp, for example, doesn't have enough tone because the air column's too high. Is where you are. Mm -hmm. And you need to be So can you do, just play me your your D sharp and just gently lower the air column into the instrument. Keep your jaw down. Low. Fine. Yes. Good. That's we need more of that mm -hmm. in here. Uh, and it does affect your intonation sometimes as well. Uh, you know what? We can correct this right now. Uh, the C sharp right here, that's really out of tune mm -hmm. this time. Um, so make sure you're listening carefully. Get the air down into the instrument for C sharp, right? Okay, the air has to go all the way, all the way down, okay? You're kind of ending up a little too high on that and without enough core in the sound. Let's try that, shall we? Much, much, much better in tune. Much better in tune. Can you get uh, one degree more tone into your C-sharp? You're still... So I was just talking there a little bit about changing the, you know, changing the position of your mouth and internally as well. Difference between ah and mm. Okay, you can experiment with that, and especially in the first octave, you do get results. You know, as you go higher on the instrument, you get less and less results uh, from doing that. But first octave, good. We can use the vowels quite effectively. Uh, to manipulate manipulate the air column in various ways. You know, uh, teachers refer to this as tone color. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's timbre. Tone color is good, also. Okay, uh, so uh, let's experiment with one other spot now. Uh, over here, 
the composer indicates a louder dynamic at 177, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you need to get a little stronger color there too. Let's have the same recipe for the B, yeah? Do that the first time. That's <laughs> that's good. You can change it right away, of course. Yeah, right. And these are the differences you kind of have to experiment with. Sometimes in the morning, you know, to just to get your tone going uh, in in the in the first octave, you can do some little vowels, you know, like. just changing between ah and mm, okay? And that's gonna change your, your position of the air column and all that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, that's a good thing to experiment with. I think you could explore that a little bit more in general mm -hmm. and kind of have this more dense, stronger quality of tone in the low register. Why don't you make that the default? And then just change from it, you know, when you want, when you want a rounder, more transparent quality, more gentleness in, in the low register, then definitely you can, you can go there. Oh, there's a little tip about that. When you do that vowel where you're kind of moving the, moving the air column up and, and you're moving the lips forward, don't unfocus the tone. Okay, easy to unfocus, but don't. Okay, that's something we all have to work on. Uh, but you know, you can, for this kind of style of music, you can change the color quite a bit in this solo, okay? And so this spot is a good spot. You'll hear a lot of flutists have sort of a, a plan for the tone color here that goes something like, uh, kind of study the harmony there, changing between dominant seventh, minor seventh, kind of uh, oscillating there just for, it does make sense with the harmony, that's why they play it that way. Um, and uh, it sounds good with, when you do it that way with the orchestra. Can you just, uh, try, let's try that design. So stay strong, very dense tone if you can for your mezzo forte, might as well be forte for all practice purposes, right? Mm -hmm. And then diminuendo. Let's have it. Ooh. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, definitely. You can refine that. And then continuing on with your articulated notes, the same articulated notes too? Well, absolutely, that's perfect. <laughs> that's the way it goes, right, right. That, that will project in the hall and, uh, and you know, this kind of tone, it, it sounds very nice in the hall. It really goes out uh, mm -hmm. away from you. Sometimes if you use the more transparent colors, there can be an issue with the, with the projection because you've subtracted some of the content from the notes, so you have to be a little bit careful about that sometimes, sometimes, not, not all the time. Uh, and you know, just as a final thing for this, maybe you can find more interest and color in your sound as you play, especially here at the end. I wanna have the feeling that you are, you are looking for the most beautiful sound you can find in your instrument at the end. Where is your your most beautiful tone there? What is the vowel? What 
what is the configuration that you need there? And that's the question, that's your homework uh, to do mm -hmm. on that. Let's hear version right now. Just really look for the most beautiful sound that you can right there. Let's hear what you do. How about, how about just right there where I started, if you would. something yeah mm -hmm. yeah you know that can also be a little bit freer okay. in in the rhythm uh, and that's because of the uh, of the orchestration so there's a harmony accord there which is being sustained and there are no moving voices okay composer also says slow down I think you can have a little bit of artistic license mm -hmm. right there maybe not quite so strict you know, and I think it functions uh, very well that way. Well, that's the adventure in tone. I think if you tie some, a little more var variety with your vibrato in with these ideas of timbre and color, mm -hmm. then I think we have something really great. And I'll bet you can just mm -hmm. do it tomorrow if you <laughs> want to. It seems like you just do stuff so fast. Thank Bravo. <laughs> of wattage and star power uh, coming in and everybody is going to love you. There is no doubt about it. Uh, it's totally irresistible to the audience. Um, but you got to relax when you play. You're too wound up. You're too tense. And it's getting in your way. Can you play the Leonore again and try to relax more? Just chill out. Okay, It's going to be fine. You sound good. All right, just trust it, all right? I want you to just relax. You could be expressive, but I want you to take some of the tension out of it.
okay. It does come across with a little bit more control and discipline. Okay. Uh, why are you doing that crazy stuff with your shoulders? <laughs> I think that you have a lot to say on the instrument, and that's, you're trying to say it with your shoulders. But, you know, I think that that is unnecessary. Uh, you can get your point across without raising and lowering your shoulders as, as you play. That's a habit which is actually a little bit challenging to get rid of. Uh, it is quite distracting from your musicianship. Uh, so I would suggest it's also probably going to make you more tense in your throat. It will change things a little bit if you raise and lower your shoulders. It's definitely going to make your neck more tense if you keep doing that. Uh, I hope you don't practice like six hours a day that way because you're going to have neck problems. You don't have time to practice no. six hours a day. <laughs> 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 <All right. laughs> Bill. Yeah. She needs to practice. Let her off. But so I do think there are these kind of positional issues where you could use your body more naturally with your stance as well. You're kind of, you know, you're kind of communicating a certain degree of angst. <laughs> about all of this as you're playing. And I think what you want to do is present things a little bit more, uh, with a little more formality, um, you know, so that the music is a little more the point. I think that, you, you know, you seem like you maybe think you are the point, okay? But Beethoven is just way better. Okay, so you, you got you know, you want to try to compete with Beethoven, good luck. Uh, but, uh, so I think there are some issues there, okay? And I do think this has to do with energy as well. So as you're trying to do this complicated thing of playing, you're sort of creating an energy world in yourself, okay? And so... Some of the energy goes for some stuff, and some of the energy goes for other stuff, okay? Uh, like just producing the sound, or doing the musical thing that you want to do, right? Some of it goes towards, hey, I'm on stage and I'm performing, you know, and this, this kind of thing, right? Um, and what you have to do is try to get this energy very focused. Okay, you're leaking energy all over the place here when you play that really should be going into the music, a little more disciplined approach towards uh, the music. Don't slow down, uh, for example, don't slow down so much right here. Okay, I want you to just let, don't hold, grab the flute so hard, don't work so hard at it, just let it come out. You have technique, I like your technique but you're getting in the way of it, actually, okay? So a little bit more, you have enough expression, don't worry, They're, they'll get the expression, okay? There's plenty to go around, all right? So just back off a little bit, one more time, and can we get the rhythm squared away? Okay, all right. I don't wanna put you in a box, but you are doing orchestral excerpt, okay? This is, this is not the tapanel, whatever, okay? <laughs> All right, this is, or this is Beethoven, huh, right? You need a frown. <laughs> no, it's a happy piece, so you can smile. Let's, let's do that, and stick with it, okay? Come on, play fast.
uh, with. So I'd say that kind of, I, that kind of worked. That was really wonderful. Bravo, fantastic. I'm so impressed. Yeah, that's very hard to do, what, what, yeah. what you just did. You know, I think that's amazing, actually. That's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a master class, actually. That's really fantastic. So thank you for, for that. I very much appreciate it. Maybe we can apply a little bit of that juice to the pop, uh, because I think we need the same. Uh, so this thing, you know, the issue is, I'll tell you what, let's, let's see how fast we can do this. So I want you to get in the same headspace that you were just in, okay? So it's expressive, but within the framework of the piece, okay? And we're gonna relax, use our body naturally, okay? Make the best tone possible. Play musically, but we need it within the framework. I will give you the framework, because I'm gonna play the accompaniment with you, and you will see, okay? So, now, uh, after you. Can we go a little bit faster? Yeah. I thought you were kind of wandering around in the tempo. Maybe mm, something a little bit more, I don't know, along this line, sure. okay? I will follow you a little bit, but this is the accompaniment, I hate to tell you, okay. you have a little housekeeping to do the the as you as you're getting louder you're going sharper when you're when you're uh, softer you're a little bit low uh, so you know that might be a little bit of just work with a tuner now I uh, I don't know those of you who know me I don't like tuners very much because they're, they're so uh, mechanical and visual and stuff but I think that when you're trying to find your bearings with your intonation, it's a good machine, okay? Just get rid of it as soon as possible. Don't rely on it. Do not put it on your stand and perform. And watch it. Please don't do that, okay? Um, and I think that one of the best uses of, of a tuner or some of these apps that they have now is uh, to get one that sings the pitch. So, so you can hear the pitch and then you can play your intervals with it at different dynamics and stuff. I think that's very useful because it teaches you to try to get in tune with something, you know, and uh, that can be a little bit, it can be a little bit hard to practice uh, playing in tune, can't it? Yeah, how do, you, how do you do it? You play with another flutist, <laughs> I guess. That helps, but then what about their intonation? Are they right? <laughs> you know, maybe you're both out to lunch. <laughs> you know, that's not going to be very helpful. Um, so, and then, then there's the piano, but then you need a pianist. Or you can plunk on the piano and then play, but that's very, that's very tedious. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think as we, as we get more experience playing with other instruments, we do learn what we have to do to, to get it in tune. But where we need to start is playing in tune with ourselves. That's, that's really what you have to 
where you have to start, and that's where you're a little bit out. You're actually, your scale, you're not actually playing in tune with yourself all the time. So a little more at attention to that and your dynamics, I think that would be good. Uh, your tone is beautiful. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think you're doing a lot of things right. So a little bit more relaxation, a little bit more natural stance, more natural use of your body, less tension and less tension in your hands. I'm afraid you're going to hurt yourself if you keep doing that when you do technical stuff. Um, and uh, a little bit more rhythm. It fit your expression into the rhythm more. The rhythm is a powerful tool. Don't abuse it. Okay. Uh, and a little more attention to intonation. And then we're there. Okay? All right. Bravo. such a good excerpt to be so strong at, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know it's obviously really something that, that you can you can really play that excerpt. Yeah. Thanks. It's good to have some excerpts which are don't give you too much trouble, you know. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you've maybe you've worked, like, worked like hell on it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Probably it sounds like you've worked hard on it uh, and you've really, I mean, you really have a concept. I mean, uh, it's really, every, everything is very beautiful about that. Thanks. Uh, such a special, special, beautiful tone. Uh, so, I like it. I, I like it very much. Uh, why can't you play the opening in one breath? You, I freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> did you yeah. chicken out or did you freak I, out? I, all of the above. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, now that now that we know each other a little better, come on, just yeah. Yeah. just do the opening. You have I can tell the way the your use of the air is so efficient. Uh, your tone is so focused. You know, there I think there's no reason why. 
Okay. You shouldn't be able to. Mm-hmm. I will say though that um, in terms of playing soft at the beginning when you have the solo, I am I am sort of of the club that believes that it should be soft. Yeah. Um, you will find flutists who do not necessarily share that okay. point of view, and they have their point. Okay. Uh, but I'm with you. I think it should be real soft. I think it should be in one breath. Then, if you're going to play it that soft, yeah. play it in one breath. Yeah. Um, and I think though that you went a little bit b- below your safety zone, mm-hmm. and you lost the tone okay. a little bit. So don't cross that line with it. Okay. You know, that can be a little bit hard to judge. You know, if you're feeling nervous and stuff, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like I like your daring approach Thanks. very much. I respect it. Thanks. Let's see if we can refine it. Yeah. Don't go too far down in pianissimo and so that you lose the tone. Take three large breaths at the beginning. Okay. One, two, three, okay. and then play. Like in okay. out or in in in. No, in 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 <laughs> in, 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 in in. Okay. <laughs> And don't play too slow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Something I, I actually respect about that quite a bit is that um, she's playing it that soft, but she didn't really sacrifice the expression. She had a very, I think, a very genuine, um, very sweet way Thanks. with it. And that's kind of what you need, you know, is to create that kind of special atmosphere. That's hard to do. I would say, you know, if you're trying to do it in, in one breath, it's a, it's a noble goal. But not if you sacrifice the expression, then you know. I don't think that. I think the expression has to come first. Don't 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 play it deadpan in order to play it in one breath. I I don't think it really works. So you kind of need this natural shaping, which you could. I think you could do a little bit more of actually. Um, so uh, maybe this idea that the C sharp has a little bit of a motor in it okay. and it kind of once you have it it's kind of grows a little bit mm-hmm. you know and I think the C sharp always has to be kind of doing something mm-hmm. you know try to avoid that sort of static so I like this idea just mm-hmm. this much crescendo yeah. just a little bit okay and then maybe you could uh, take a little more time. I think your triplet is is too fast, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. E da, 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 da. Okay. It can be actually quite proper. I think Debussy wrote it correctly, and so uh, let's not rush okay. uh, the triplet. You can fit it in. So the bar has this, this sort of shape. Maybe, maybe there's some gravity in this uh, that the G natural yeah. has a little bit more weight, and then you, it kind of floats back up okay. to the C sharp. So you kind of give the whole bar a little bit of this natural sort sort of shape. Uh, that's my preference. I don't know. I'm sure there's many other preferences. You. Uh, but let's dee, da, 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 mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. You know, Debussy could have written this quite differently, couldn't Yeah. yeah. And it would be easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> but it wouldn't really have that the very special 
magic that this rhythm gives it, mm -hmm. you know. So let's not let's not rush it. Uh, let's test. So beautiful sound. Make the C sharp do something a little less percivo, and really let's get the rhythm very very proper mm -hmm. if we can. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's really coming into focus mm -hmm. in all these ways, and uh, when you get the when you get the tone, the concept, and the phrasing, and you put it all all together, so they all kind of work together, then you get boom. It's it's like, uh, and that's what the audition committee is wanting to hear is a player who kind of has put all those elements together, you know, in just sort of a very beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the next one, uh, have you played in orchestra? Yeah. The, yeah, the next one, as you know, you kind of have to be louder because yeah. they just, you know, yeah. right? So, <laughs> <laughs> it just, uh, if this, if the first one was the ghost, okay, this is the real being, okay? Okay. Right, yeah. right. So, let's have that a little bit stronger, I would say at least can do that in one breath, I'll give you five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> if you perhaps can't do it in one breath, where would you <laughs> Well, then just you do what I, what I always do, just breathe after this G, after G right G, okay. here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know. This one goes on into mm -hmm. the orchestra. It's a little bit different than the than the first one. Okay, okay so we don't diminuo. I know there's a diminuendo, but maybe don't do so much of yeah. it. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the A sharp is longer. So okay, yeah, that's the idea there. I think you could with this one, you could you could even vary your vibrato, maybe even a little bit more. Just go, you know, with your recorder and ask yourself, what about the vibrato? Like, what do I really want? Is this exactly what I want? I would say it sounds a little bit, uh, just maybe a little bit mechanical, the same, or, or something. That's, I'm, I'm kind of getting a sense of that. Okay. And it, I think it can have a little bit more, a little more passion and creativity in it. It's quite different than the first one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Okay, and then you did some wonderful things here. I would suggest that uh, for a natural at 12 eight, just you're gonna have to be a little bit stronger uh -huh. than that. I, if I were on the audition committee and I heard that, I would think, well, you know, for principal flute, I, I think we might lose the sound in, in the orchestra. You know, it's just, the player should know that it just has to be a little fuller than that, you know. Uh, so maybe just bring up the dynamic, if you would, uh, a little bit there. Uh, this one is kind of, has kind of an interesting expressive markings and it doesn't, uh, I think you could bring those out a little bit. So this idea of a new crescendo, Can we just hear that?
I, I, I can't criticize that. I think that is just so beautiful. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you.